Welcome to the Today's Leader Podcast. Building Tomorrow's Best Leaders, Today. Way to go, guys. Way to go. Keep it going. Good job, guys. All right, Paul. I see you. Finish, huh? Let's go. Hey there, it's Coach Girl here and welcome to episode 413 of the Today's Leader podcast, Building Tomorrow's Best Leaders Today. Now, we're re- we are all aware of the elephant in the room, but are we aware that they're not alone? Are we aware that there may be mice in the room? High Performance Coach David Wood joins us today on this episode of the Today's Leader podcast. David has just released his latest book called Mouse in the Room Because the Elephant Isn't Alone. The book has been described as something that will change your life and the world. Because we've all been conditioned to hide behind a mask, afraid to reveal our true selves for fear of being rejected, getting a bad reaction, or losing something that we may value. So we often ignore the mice in the room, but it's which is really quite interesting because often we'll also ignore the elephant in the room. But there's so many more subtle animals at play in our lives, in our businesses, and in our leadership groups. Now, in David's book, he shows us how the simple yet courageous act of noticing and naming our mice can profoundly change the way that we live, the way that we lead. So after a word from our sponsor, it is our pleasure to welcome David Wood, High Performance Coach, to the Today's Leader podcast. The podcast is brought to you by Think and Grow Business, the home of the Think and Grow Business Mastermind. If you're serious about growing your business, get serious and join a mastermind group today. Find out more at thinkandgrowbusiness.com.au. And it's my pleasure to welcome to the Today's Leader podcast, building tomorrow's best leaders today. Please welcome David Wood, the up, the author of the upcoming book called Mouse in the Room. How are you, David? Thanks, Tony. I'm good. And it's, uh, it's good to hear an Aussie accent after 20 years <laughs> in the US. It's always nice to talk to an Aussie again. Yeah, it's... Uh, the accent is just so, um, I suppose it's almost like our security blanket. I feel the same way when I talk with people right around the world for this particular podcast and it's always like you're coming home when you're talking with someone with an uh, Australian yeah. accent. So an Aussie in Los Angeles, that's an intriguing enough story. So let's get started. Let's share the David Wood story. Sure. Well, the short version is... Uh I grew up very left-brained because I had a tragedy when I was little. My little sister was killed and I was there and I witnessed it. Now, we didn't know at the time what the impact was, but apparently what I did is I shut down the emotional side. Now, Aussies aren't really known for being super emotional and and expressive anyway. I think we got that from the British. Uh, So my parents, you know, they never said, how are you feeling, David? What are you aware of in your body right now? Oh, you're angry? Oh, let's hear more about that. That's not how it went. If if I was angry, I'd get in trouble. If I was sad and crying, I'd get in trouble. So um, me especially shut down my emotions and got really good at left brain thinking. So Mm. if if it's numbers, business, money and systems, I'm your guy. I got, uh, I came top of the school. I got paid to go to college and then when a job opportunity came up in New York, they transferred me to New York and I'm consulting to Sony Music and Ford and Exxon. And I figured I had it made. But then I discovered uh, that I wasn't happy. And part of it was this Australian upbringing of just not really sharing what's honestly going on inside. And part of it was my, my, my special circumstances where I think I went even past that and someone said, go and do this personal growth program. 
And I didn't want to do it, Tony, because they smiled way too much and they all wore name tags. And I'm like, I don't trust this at all. But fortunately, they cracked my heart open. They cracked my yeah. cynicism. And I realized there are people who actually want to make the world a better place. And that's where this book comes in, Mouse in the Room. I've found that to the extent that we don't share what's actually going on and we hide emotions, even from ourself. Yeah. Oh, I feel disappointed by that. Or I'm a little betrayed by that. Or oh, I'm a bit anxious about that. We hide them from ourselves. And then we particularly, if we discover them, we don't name it with the other person. Mm. It creates disconnection, yeah. isolation, loneliness, business results start to tank. But when we do start to name what's actually happening, life gets better. It does take courage and it takes a simple roadmap, which we outline in the book, but life and business start to get better. The concept of not being happy, was that something that you were conscious of before coming to that realization? I'm imagining that someone as logical, straightforward, practical as what you were, the concept that, hey, I'm not happy, was, was that foreign to you at that, that particular time? I didn't even know that I wasn't happy. All I knew is I had a pain in my stomach. Okay. And, and I went to the doctor and the doctor said, well, this sounds like a classic case of stress. I'm like, no, I'm not stressed. I just got a pain in my stomach. But my, my marriage wasn't going well. And it wasn't until I got to this course by Landmark Education where I started to slowly but surely unpack the things that are going on. Now, I call these things that are unnamed, I call them mice. And the okay. reason I call them that is because we all know about the elephant in the room. We have that expression in our culture. You see it, I see it, no one's saying anything. Well, yeah, I could have written a book called Let's Address the Elephant in the Room. But many animals in the room are much more subtle. Maybe it's something I feel and I don't know if you're aware of it. Maybe, yeah. maybe I'm just turning up to a meeting tired and maybe people can't tell or maybe they can tell. I don't know. That's not an elephant. That's a mouse. Mm. So the book is about naming, firstly naming for ourselves, oh, this is why I don't like this. This is what I want from this person. This is why I'm upset with that guy from yeah. six months ago and then artfully naming it so we can come into connection with the other person. Yeah, it's a very interesting concept because of, of little animals, because everyone is fully aware when there's an elephant in the room, you've got this undertone, there's a bit of current, potentially some unrealized tension. You can feel it, you can sense it, but, yep. the, and, but the elephant's sitting there light as day in, in the minds of most of the people in attendance. The mouse is a little bit more sneaky sometimes the the mouse is nowhere near as visible so i can really appreciate the the, the concept but is the mouse a personal mouse or is everyone potentially got their own mice everyone's got their own mice all yeah. the time and there are, we've got mice of the mind so any thought that we have is a mouse yeah. any emotion that we have yeah. And any, any body sensation, any part of our experience as a mouse, some of them can be quite big mice. We call them rodents of unusual size for any Princess Bride fans. Um, they can be as big as an elephant. Yeah. But the difference, as you've spotted, the difference is an elephant, it's so clear. Like if someone, if I turned up to this interview with blood on my face, that's an elephant, right? If we don't talk about it, it's just going to be totally weird. Yeah. But but me turning up to this interview feeling tired because I didn't sleep well, partly because I just moved to LA and everything's new and I'm turned upside down. If I don't name that, it could, it could be weird. It could be weird for me because I'm mm -hmm. thinking, boy, I hope I show up well on this interview and I'm feeling really tired. I had an interview a couple of days ago and I mentioned, yeah, I'm, I'm having some issues sleeping, I'm fine. And it's a big transition because this happened or whatever. And we bonded over it. The other host said, oh, you know what? I just had a, a transition too. And, and you know what? I'm showing up to this one a little tired. We bonded over it. And, and it was like I got energy from that. And then yeah. we went on to have a great interview. Whereas what most of us would do, let's just cover it up. 
Yeah. Let's not say anything. Let's just pretend I'm fine all the time. How are you? Good. How are you? Oh, fine, thanks. That's mm. the culture that I want to get away from. Let's yeah. stop ignoring our mice and start discovering them and naming them. Yeah, very much so. It's, it's like when we try to snowball or, or push down our emotions. There's going to come a time where they're like a jack-in-the-box and they're just going to pretty much explode in our face and usually that's not a good thing because we've normally got some pretty dire consequences that happen when that particular happen um, when that particular incident happens where we're trying to um, minimize our emotions squash them down and, and potentially ignore them so I'm, I'm imagining it's a really similar concept to the mice I think so and any listeners who are thinking oh I don't squash anything down I share everything the way you, it might manifest is, is with your poor health. Mm -hmm. You may have a physical issue that's going on because mouse aren't being named. You may find uh, that you're having issues sleeping. You may find yourself gravitating towards alcohol or sugar, ice cream, overeating, TV, mm. video games, medication. There are so many things that we'll try and use to cover the fact that we're not fully expressed and not yeah. actually connected. I'm really feeling the lack of connection since I've, I've been here about two weeks now. And I used to ha I got, had my whole community back in Boulder, Colorado. Yeah. And here I know two or three people and no one that I know well enough to be a cuddle buddy. Or, well, that's not true, but it would take some courage for me to say, hey, I think I could use some touch. Mm -hmm. You offer some, some cuddling, particularly with my male friends, yeah. right? So, but that's a pretty big mouse to name. And if I don't go, if I don't name it, hey, I think I need some touch. It's going to come out in, in ways that are not particularly pleasant. Wow. So you've been coaching for many, many years, 20 odd 20 years. 20 something years, yep. So is this part of, is the book part of what you've learned as you've been coaching and consulting with people or has it come yeah. from a direct... Um, something a direct incident that, that happened it's been a slow boil uh and i blame again i blame landmark education because i'd, I'd go and do a course with them and they'd say okay who do you feel incomplete with mm. and i'd say no one they'd say look harder and then i'd be like well yeah i'm still kind of annoyed at this guy from high school uh and they say okay well who wouldn't you want to pass on the street Oh, okay, that's a longer list. I, I don't really like this person. I don't really, I resent this person. I feel guilty about what I did to this person. The more we went into it, there were so many mice, yeah. historical mice, and they would encourage me to go and name those mice with those people. I'm like, you're crazy. Come on, that was 20 years ago. I, I don't even have his number. And they said, just trust us. There's magic that can happen mm. when you tell the truth. And so I went and had amazing phone calls. I called a bully from 20 years earlier and said, I have resented you ever since high school and I'm letting it go. You don't have to do anything. I'm just, I'm just letting you go. I'm, I'm letting it go and moving on. I called a, a girl who broke up with me twice and gave me the cold shoulder, twice. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd resented her. I called my boss who, um, I had sued because I, I didn't feel the company had treated me fairly. And then 10 years later, I'm like, is there bad blood there? Because we used to get on well. Called him up, had an amazing conversation. He told me about his divorce and stuff that he never would have shared while wow. I was working with him. So Landmark kept encouraging me to do the, name the scary mice. Yeah. And time and time again, I found that I got so much freedom from doing it and so much connection. Some of those people I hated became friends. Wow. And That's so now um, I still would have written the book except that someone was in a course with me and she just started one day. She said, you've just got to name the thing. Mm. I'd be like, what are you talking about? She said, you've got to name the thing. Just name the thing. She kept on going. <laughs> Finally, we got to understand. She was saying, whatever's in between you, whatever's there in the room, you just have to name it. You may not fix it, but in naming it, there's power. And I said, that's, that's strong enough to write a book on. That yeah. one concept could change the world. So yeah. we did, I, we wrote a book on it. 
I find it interesting with things like high school reunions and whatnot. I went to a 30-year high school reunion and it was really interesting the way I felt when I was meeting all these people I went to school with, you know, 30 years back. And all of a sudden, in so many ways, I was meeting them for the first time. I was meeting them and they were interesting, they were dynamic, they had their own parts of success and their own parts of failure and I found them all fascinating. But then as I'm walking away, I'm thinking, why did, why did I, how did I miss that when I was at school? And then when I talk to so many people with the, the experience of the high school reunion, so many people feel the same way. I've had people saying, I just felt I had to apologise to everyone. You know, and all of this sort of thing, and, and I guess that's part of that regression that um, that we, when we think about the the lives that we've had, the people that we've met, there are going to be some unresolved feelings, emotions um, that we have within ourselves when that person comes back into our life for whatever reason. So, so when yeah. you talk about naming them, do you name the person or do you create a name for them? You name the mouse, which is the experience that you're having. So, yeah. uh, so for yeah. example, let's deal with a historical mouse. So I, I called this guy and I said, look, you're going to think I'm totally crazy. Like, I'm really nervous making this phone call. Yeah. Those are two mice right there. I'm yeah. worried you're going to think I'm crazy and I'm really nervous. Boom. Wow. Now, once I name those mice, I didn't say I'm naming mice with you, mm. but when, once I name those it brought us in connection. He, he said, oh, well, what have you got? You know, shoot. He was ready to listen because he knew I was on my edge. Mm -hmm. And then I said, I always resented you and here's why and, and I'm letting it go. And he said the most amazing thing. He said, well, what can I do or say now to help us move forward? Oh, wow. I'm like, what? We ended up becoming friends again after that. So those were two mice when I, but that's historical mice, right? You don't have to go and name all of your mice ever since you were born. Mm. You may get a lot of freedom from it. It's gonna be easier if you work with a coach to do it. Yeah. But we've got mice, we've got mice from six months ago. We've got mice from a week ago, last week, this morning. Today, when you go to work, there might, someone might say something, maybe in a meeting and you feel shut down. Like yeah. you feel cut off and you didn't get to finish it. Well, after reading the book, hopefully you'll say, hey, I, I realize I'd like to finish that thought. Would that be okay? I think it could make a difference to the direction we're going here. Wow. You name a mouse. You may, you may or may not say I felt shut down. That's the kind of thing you might do in private. Mm. Go to whoever did it and say, you know, a couple of times I felt like I'm saying something and then you jump in and I don't want to shout over you. And I'm wondering what, is there anything we can do about that? That might be done in private. Yeah, we actually have a, a three step process, call it the 3D process in the book. And the D's are very easy to remember. Discover yeah. your mice, because all you might know is I don't like what's happening, yeah. but we've got to actually discover what's going on. Decide if you're going to name it, because not all mice are worth naming. Yeah. So you need to weigh it up and like, is the potential upside better than the downside here? OK, I'm going to name it. And then three, disarm. You want to disarm the other person. You don't go with, hey, we need to talk. I'm pissed. That's not going to work very well. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, you follow the steps in the book. You might ask for consent. Hey, there's something I'd like to go over. And here's why. Here's the positive reason that I'd like to go over it. I think it'd be, it'd be maybe we work better as a team. Or I just want to clear the air and be able to move on and stop thinking about this. And do you have time now? Yeah. Boom. Person disarmed, okay, what have you got? Shoot. Yeah. You mentioned courage at, at, um, at the beginning of our conversation today. And when you're talking through a lot of the, the processes, that I guess, involved in naming the mice, I'm, sim I'm feeling that courage. I'm feeling that need for courage for people, A, to be strong and courageous within themselves, but also in potentially following through on some of the, the, the conversations that will take place. So with, with that in mind, how does someone who doesn't have that courage 
obtain that courage to start to put some of this into practice, David? Oh, great question. So remember that courage is not the absence of fear. So we've all got courage. Courage is just, even though I'm afraid, I'm going to do this yeah. anyway. Now, filling in the worksheet in the book, the 3D worksheet will help because yeah. until you have a good positive reason to share that, to name the mouse, why do it? Why do it? So when you come to the decide section, let me back up a second. Yeah. Another thing that stops us is lack of clarity. I can't go and talk to this person because I don't even know really why I'm upset. I just know I don't like this. Mm. Once you get clear, oh, I felt shut down. I didn't, didn't feel heard or I felt insulted, which said seemed to be kind of putting me down. Once we know that, okay, it gets easier because now you can explain it to the other person. That will help. You need less courage now already because you got clear. I once had a podcast host. Uh, I offered him a coaching session as a gift, as a thank you, and he didn't show up for the session. Now, okay. I wasn't a fan of that. I didn't like that. I'd shown up. He didn't. But then he wrote to me, said, oh, my bad, my mistake. I've used your booking link to rebook it for next week. Now, I had a reaction to that. All I knew is I don't want to do this session. Mm. Now, I couldn't go and talk to him because I wasn't clear. Now, when I go, went through the worksheet, oh, you know what? I don't feel like my time is being respected. Mm. The fact that he's assuming I'm willing to rebook it, and how do I know he's going to show up for the second one? Yeah. So once I got clear on that, now it was a lot easier to go to him because I could go, oh, this is what I realized. The next thing is uh, deciding, should I do it? And when I filled it in, I'm like, what's the downside? Okay, downside, mm. he could get annoyed, defensive, and he might badmouth me in the industry. He might say, this guy, this guy is uh, oversensitive, isn't he? he's a lot of work, don't, don't have him on your show. Mm. So now I know the downside. What's the upside? Well, the upside is that I could feel enthusiastic about giving him this session and I could feel closer with him and we could rock the session out and forge a bond and maybe do some great work together. Mm. Okay, now you can see how I need less courage because yeah. I know what went on and now I can see what the upside would be and, and so now the path was clearer to name it and I actually yeah. put this into a video and I said to him, if you're willing to, to hear my reaction to you missing the session, please continue and watch the rest of this video. And if not, stop it now, just delete it, that's fine. And then I, I got to share it, and I must have recorded the video four or five times because I didn't like how it came out the first few times. Yeah. And it was too long and it was a little blamey. I'm like, I can do better. Yeah. Got it down and just said, hey, what I'd need to feel good about doing the session is to know that you get that there was an impact on my time, that that's half an hour, I'm never gonna get back. To know that you're absolutely committed to showing up 100%. And there was a third thing which I forget. And I'm not saying you're disrespecting my time. Yeah. I'm just saying that's how it felt and I wanna feel like you respect it. Mm. And I'd love to hear your reaction to this video. He wrote back and said, I've never had a message like this in my life can I share this on my podcast? Because this is true communication. This is you mm -hmm. standing up for yourself and you said it so well. So doing the 3D worksheet will probably mean that you need less courage because now you've got clarity and you've got an upside and you've got the process on disarming the other yeah. person. But I'll tell you, Tony, even using this, I've had calls that I've been terrified to make. Yeah. I've, I've, had a, I've made a call that could lose me my relationship with my partner. I've named a mouse that, that could have sent me to jail because it was, I'd, I'd broken a law when I was younger and it just felt wrong. The older yeah. I got and I decided I need to confess, that's a confession mouse and I need to make this right. If yeah. the person had prosecuted, I might have done jail time. So sometimes it's just going to be really scary and the last thing I'll say is when you named the person, hey, this is hard for me to say. I'm really scared to have this conversation mm -hmm. and I'd like to do it anyway because of this good reason. Um, do you have a few minutes? 
people are often going to be much more gentle with you because you're being vulnerable. Yeah. And, and you're naming your mice already before you even get started. Yeah. You hear a lot of, you know, that vulnerable void. You hear a lot of that in the concept of today's leaders, right? They need to be vulnerable. They need to be authentic. They need to be genuine. But then we, we also hear of things like they need to be emotionally intelligent. They need to be switched on. They need to show up. And, and some people see some of those concepts as being contradictory to each other. So authenticity sometimes is misinterpreted as, as being natural. And for example, so when someone's natural, I'm, I'm going to react with my emotions. But that's not what it's about, is it? No, no. Um, there's a sweet spot and there's an art. It's an art form. Now, what yeah. most of us are doing is just not even going there. You know, if we feel angry in response to someone in a meeting, we'll just bottle it up. Yeah. Um, now, what I'm suggesting is that you don't ignore it, but you also don't have to dump it on the other person. You don't have to react and yeah. let your emotions run wild like I might in acting class tonight. What you could do is say, wow, I notice I'm having a reaction to that. I'm actually feeling some anger come up. I don't want to speak from that place. So mm. I'm going to go and take five minutes and then if you're open to it, I'd like to come back and talk about it, but I don't want to yell at you, right? Yeah. We're naming it, naming the mouse, but we're not, we're actually bigger than the emotions. And I like yeah. to use an example from, uh, I got this from Brene's Brown, Brene Brown's book, Dare to Lead, and I may have changed it in my head since then, but you, you're not, if you're the CEO, you're not going to go to the boardroom and say, we're running off a cliff. I don't know what to do. The economy's tanking. We're going under. Ah! Even if that's what you feel, yeah. you're not going to go and do that in the boardroom. You do that with your coach. You do that with your best friend. You do yeah. that with your therapist. And then you may go and say, some of you may be scared. In this current climate, I don't blame you. Sometimes I am too. We don't have all the answers yet but we've got the beginnings of a plan and together we will find our way. Yeah, yeah, powerful. It's, uh, I love that terminology, we're bigger than our emotion. So um, right. that's just resonated so deeply, just those, that very simple word. And you know, the reality is if people sit back and look at themselves, they, they should realize that, that we're bigger than our emotions. And oh, we're, we, we're, we're not always though. Yeah, we're bigger okay, than our emotions when we have a high level of consciousness. So when you're lost in anger, you're not bigger than your emotions at all. You are your anger. You, that's you it. Anger. Yeah, okay. that, that's it. As soon as you can say, I notice I'm angry. Now yeah. you've had to expand beyond the anger to be able to see it. Oh, I notice I'm angry. I notice this is, we use those words a lot in authentic relating. I notice uh, I'm feeling attracted to you. I notice I'm feeling anxious. Uh, I've, I've got acting class tonight and I'm doing my first scene in front of the class in two days. Yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty nervous about it. Um, but I can see that, okay, I'm feeling nervous. I have that emotion. I'm bigger than it because I can see it. But until I yeah. see it, I'm just running around the house freaking out. I might be snapping at people and whatever because I, yeah. I haven't grown bigger than the emotion. Part of the reason we're writing this book is to help us all know ourselves better. Oh, yeah. this is my trigger. This pissed me off. This yeah. has upset me. I feel sad about that. Yo, hearing that your father died, I notice I'm, I'm feeling some emotion. I'm feeling some empathy. I'm really sorry. I've had lost myself and I'm really sorry to hear that. Right? That's mouse naming. Yeah. In, instead of just, oh, how are you doing with it? You know, yeah. how are you? Or is there anything I can do? Which are also nice things to say. Yeah. It's naming your experience. And those are magic words as well. I just mentioned, I notice. Other yeah. magic words are hearing that and then continue to name your mouse. Hearing that, I notice I'm feeling this, or I'm noticing a desire to help you in some way, and I don't know what I can do. Is there anything I can do? 
we're revealing ourselves instead of jumping to the solution, which was how I was brought up. Yeah, yeah, very much so. It, so when does the book come out, David? June 13. June 13. And um, looking forward to uh, having a bit of a bow peep and having a, a read through it. It sounds like a fascinating concept. But, but I guess part of my other questions for you at the moment, you've had a really successful coaching and consulting uh, background. You've now moved to Los Angeles, and as you said, you've got acting classes. So you're moving and you're having a bit of a shift in your life um, in some ways. What was, the, what was the compelling reason that you've made this shift? I've had a mouse uh, for about 10 years. I've, I've yeah. thought to myself, I wonder what would happen if I really tried acting out. I've been called to performance all my life. I've done stand-up comedy, improv on stage, yeah. uh, motivational speaking. I play guitar and sung uh, on TV, actually. I was on Hey Hey It's Saturday, Red Faces, <laughs> if you remember that. I actually did that going back. Yeah. So, so I've dabbled, but I thought, yeah. just before I die, I'd like to know what would happen if I, like, would I be good at it? Would I enjoy it? And so that's been in the back of my mind. And eight months ago, I said to a friend, I think it might be coming time soon because I'm, I'm, I've got a mobile job and I don't have a partner right now. And maybe it's time to go to LA next year when my lease is up. And she said, oh, I did that. I'm like, really? And we started talking about it. Well, a week later, you've got to be careful what you say to the universe. Because mm -hmm. a week later, she called me and said, I'm going to go and audition for, for Dracula. There's a local play. Do you want to come with me and audition? And I said, okay, yeah, I haven't even taken a class yet, but you got it. And then I did yeah. my prep and I studied and I, I went and got a coach and, and I memorized my lines and I showed up. I got the lead. I got to play Dracula in this, um, in this performance, in this paid production. So like my first gig, I actually got, got money for it. And I was like, wow. And that gave me the courage to keep on going. And I did some short films and I did a couple of commercials. And then I came out to LA to check it out and it felt good. And I found a good school and I said, all right. Now I tell you what, this is still taking a lot of courage because I had a great life mm -hmm. in Boulder. I had a wonderful yeah. setup and to move to a big busy city and I'm noise sensitive. So there's noises all around. My dog's barking and woofing at every single bump. It's not easy right now, but I just, I don't want to die without knowing what yeah. would happen. Now the coaching and training isn't going anywhere. I've been doing that for 25 years. As you see, I'm, I'm still here. I'm launching a book, yeah. but I'm also working on a few good men, which I'm presenting to the class on Wednesday. I got the uniform arriving tomorrow. It's all very exciting. <laughs> Just all those balls that you've got juggling up in the air is just fascinating to listen to as well, David. So um, who's been the inspiration for you in your journey? Well, a couple of people come to mind. Jack Canfield yeah. from Chicken Soup and the Success Principles. And I think it was, I mean, yeah, his success with the books, but it was seeing him speak and just getting his presence and yeah. his depth on stage, I'm like, I wanna know this guy. And then Byron Katie is a huge inspiration to me. She's, I don't even, she doesn't even seem truly human because I think she really has grown beyond personality, uh, but she's just pure love. And yeah. I went and spent a month with Katie. And sometimes when I get lost, I, I ask myself, what would Katie say? What would Katie do right now? So those, those are two big inspirations for me. Excellent. So when we talk about leadership and we talk about today's leaders, what are some of the really important traits that leaders should look within that they should have to become great leaders? Well, firstly, I want to give a definition of leadership. This is my definition of leadership. Hey, over there looks way better than over here. Who's with me? Yeah. That's leadership. So firstly, you need to work out where you're going and where you want people to go and then enroll them. And this was, a, this was a skill that I learned at Landmark Education, enroll people. People are enrolled yeah. when they are touched, moved and inspired such that they take action. Yeah. 
So, you know, I've been enrolling people most of my life. Like, I tell you what, just just last week I went to the to the managing agent of the apartment and I said, I'm having trouble. I'm right next to the elevators. I hear the machinery. Have you got anything that's quiet? He said, well, here are two places, but they're not free for a month and I can't get you in to see them. You're just going to have to trust me and go on faith and move in and hope you like it. And I'm like, really? Have we met? <laughs> I went and knocked on the door. Yeah. I went to those apartments. Now, this is LA. This is a busy, big city. I went and knocked on the door and managed to enroll each of those individuals in letting me into their apartment to have a look at the view and see how it is and answer questions on it and see if it's an apartment I really want to move into. That's leadership. How to, you know, the way I positioned it and uh, authentically revealing, which I'll get to in a second, but enrollment is, is, is huge. Have them want to do it. And if you can have them feel like it's their idea, even better. The second thing that comes up for me is the reveal, and that's where mouse naming comes in. Yeah. So one thing you can re reveal is your why. Don't just tell them, this is how we're gonna change the meeting. You could mm -hmm. say, re name your mouse, name your why. Yeah. I want to change the meeting because I feel like they're going long and we're losing energy, and by the end of it, we can't wait to get off the call. Anybody agree? Right, you get some agreement. And then here's what I'd like to see. I want to see a meeting in which we feel inspired and energized every time the call finishes. Who's interested in that? Yeah. And then the third thing that's coming up is the collaborative lead. I think 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it was more, I've got the answer, follow me. Yeah. Now it's more, okay, let's hear ideas. I've got an idea for sure, but maybe someone's going to name the very thing that I was going to say, or maybe they'll come up with something better, or maybe they'll come up with three terrible ideas and we end up moving towards something that really works, but now everyone feels a part of it. I had one client who wanted to change meetings and I said, why don't you try this? Because he wanted everyone to be a leader. And so mm. everyone had their ideas and they settled on something and he said, why don't we try it for two weeks? We'll reconvene after two weeks and we'll see how it went. They loved yeah. the new format and everyone had bought into it. It wasn't him handing it down like Moses on the Mount. Mm. Uh, so those are three things that, that come to me off the top of my head for today's leaders. Excellent. Great. Oh, what about can I add one more piece? Oh, go ahead. Go for it. No, you're right. Oh. Well, you know, we talked about like how much do you reveal? Mm. I want to share an example. I was, uh, a couple of months ago, I was in a Colorado prison and we were teaching the inmates about authentic relating and mouse naming and leadership. And the director of Colorado prisons drove a couple of hours, no, he drove an hour on his Sunday, on his day off, to come and sit in on our class to see what we were teaching. And he spoke for 10 minutes. And at the end of that 10 minutes, I was like, I will follow this guy anywhere. I want to help him. I reached out and offered to coach him. Mm. And one of the things that he did during that speech is he said, he shared a, a personal example. He said, look, sometimes I don't know what's right or the right way to do it. I had a coworker come up and shared something. It was so exciting and we had a hug. And I'm like, am I going to get in trouble for, mm. for hugging her? And he was so revealed, he wasn't collapsing in it, he wasn't crying from it, he wasn't bleeding from it, but he just said, sometimes I don't know the right way and we'll find it together, we'll work it out. I, my story is that every inmate sitting there in that circle felt closer to him as a result yeah. of him sharing yeah. something personal about himself. You don't have to you know, share all about your cancer diagnosis or you know, all the ups and downs of you feeling sad about mm. this or you cried in a movie last night. But sometimes just that they know a bit about you and about what makes you tick and what drives you, I think, let's name those mice. Mm. Creating a, a bit more of a bond and alignment with the hearts and minds of our people is uh, always a positive. So what about failure, David? How do you... Describe your relationship with failure. 
I fail a lot. <laughs> I fail a lot. I think that's the illusion. When we see someone successful, we just figure, oh, maybe they're lucky or they've got things yeah. I don't or they, they're smarter than me. <clears throat> hey, some of those things may be true. But what you usually don't see is the thousand things that they try that never went anywhere. Mm. Like yeah. the number of products I've created that just tanked. The, um, the, the number of people I've reached out to and said, hey, would you like to be part of the book? You know, would, would you be up for endorsing the book? Would you be up for writing the forward? The number of no's I get. Yeah. And you could say, ah, oh, he, he failed. You could say I failed at uh, some of the acting ventures I've tried because I've done some short films. They didn't go anywhere. Some of them were terrible. Yeah. So you could say, oh, well, that was a failure. But I think what matters is where's the end point of the story? Is that where the story yeah. ends? Or does that story end, does the story continue with, I went and got myself an acting coach and I got better at it and I did a thousand auditions. And out of those mm. thousand auditions, I got 10 pretty good gigs. And yeah. same with starting a coaching business. I, you know, initially I got so many no's. I don't, no, I don't need coaching. I don't want to pay for coaching. And then you start building it up. I tell you, and it just stun a team of oxen in its tracks. The number of things I've done that don't go anywhere. What you hear about normally is the stuff that worked. You hear about the book that worked. You hear that Jack Canfield wrote the forward to my last book. You might, I might tell a story about the speech where I sold $387,000 from the stage. Those are good stories. But you won't, unless you ask, you won't always hear about the deep depression that I've been yeah. through or the deep anxiety or the, the complicated grief process I had because no one took me to therapy when my sister died. We often don't hear about those things. Yeah. And I think it's important that we do so that, it, so that we can all go, oh, that's a full person. This is another reason I'm writing a book. Show people more of you, the up and the down. You're unconsciously giving them permission to do the same. And I say that yeah. will change the world. That's absolutely excellent. And uh, I couldn't think of a better description that I've heard when I've asked that question. So that's 100% true. How can people connect with you, David? Thank you. Well, if you like this concept of mouse in the room and you think as I do, it's gonna make a difference in your life and the world, go and get the book. Particularly June 13, if this comes out early enough, Go and get the book. In fact, we'll have a special on. You could buy 20 books uh, on sale and gift them to your friends, mouseintheroom.com. And if you do want to help us reach the bestseller list, then there are three things I would ask. Buy 10 to 20 books. We'll, we'll have a, a super special going. Come back a day later and leave a five-star review if you think it's worth it. And thirdly, post on social media that you went and got the book. So your friends have a chance yeah. to buy it as well. Those things, I understand, help us make some noise with the book and help us reach the bestseller status. And it's an excuse for a party. It's an excuse for us to come together from every country around the world yeah. and start making some noise about this concept of mouse naming and stop yeah. ignoring our mice and putting on an act yeah. for everybody. Yeah, it's an amazing concept and I can't re wait to read more about it so thank you David, mouse been... in the room we dropped the the from the beginning of it so it's just mouse in the room dot mm. com four simple words excellent no worries i'll make sure that link is in the show notes david it's been an absolute pleasure um you investing in today's leaders today i really have appreciated this conversation and yes we will get the podcast episode out around the launch so that we can um um, help you be, get the best seller or the, make this the best seller that it deserves to be. Oh, thank you, Tony. And now, it's time for Tony's Two Cents. What a great conversation that was with David. What a great conversation from David. Having the courage to name your mice. What a brilliant concept. And we all have, and I, I guess so many people would just call it baggage, wouldn't they? That, that we've just got this baggage. But I love the concept that we call it 
mice. What a brilliant concept, and I hope that it truly resonates with you. And of course, his book is now out and available wherever you can buy um, books, uh, great books. And I'd highly recommend you heading, following my lead and grabbing a copy from Amazon. Now, the framework that David spoke about, he walked through the three Ds. Uh, he calls it the three-step process. Discover your mice. Um, decide whether you should act on it. And then, and as he said, not all mice will be acted on or should be acted on. And then disarm the other person. So discover, decide, and disarm. Now, that's a three-step framework that I can see becoming very useful for leaders in many situations, not just on naming your mice. How else do you think that you could utilise that 3D framework within your leadership career. Discover, decide, and disarm. Once again, just a huge thank you for David for investing in today's leaders. And of course, all his links are in the show notes. If you're looking to build better leadership skills, check out the Today's Leader website at todaysleader.com.au. We really are driving a leadership revolution to build tomorrow's best leaders today. Today's leader is a collective, the mindset to make a difference, the ability to create an impact. Think and Grow Business hosts our Today's Leader Masterminds. Think and Grow Business, where we focus on personal, professional and business growth. Book your free 30-minute discovery call right from the homepage at thinkandgrowbusiness.com.au. Don't forget, wherever you are, you are standing stronger, braver and wiser don't forget the golden rule. Don't be an arsehole. I'll see you all again next week. Bye for now.